Okay, so uh, welcome to this next video in which we are discussing nicotine and the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Okay, so now that we've seen how it is that acetylcholine binds to uh, the acetylcholine binding site, i.e. how it binds to these aromatic residues in the uh, acetylcholine binding site. Let's now see why it is that nicotine combined to the uh, acetylcholine binding sites on uh, the other uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors that we've seen, such as the ganglionic and CNS forms, uh, but it can't bind to the one on the skeletal muscle cells. And basically, the reason is, is that in the uh, acetylcholine binding site of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor on skeletal muscles, you have one amino acid that's different. Okay, so let me tell you about one amino acid that's different in the uh, one in skeletal muscle. So let's say this is the skeletal muscle one. Basically, what we have found is that very nearby the aromatic nest, okay, so let's say here, in the skeletal muscle form, what you have is a glycine amino acid. Okay, so at some position on uh, this protein subunit here, you have a glycine subunit. Okay, now if you look at the equivalent position in the ganglionic and uh, the CNS forms, instead you have a lysine. Okay, and this is the only uh, significant difference that we've been able to find. Now, let's have a look at the different structures of the amino acid glycine and lysine. So, we'll start off with glycine. Glycine is the simplest amino acid of all of them. So, let's start off with the core amino acid structure. It's the amino group and the carboxylic acid group down here. And then the R group of glycine is just a hydrogen off the alpha carbon. Okay, so this is glycine. Uh, and the single, uh, well, the three-letter amino acid code for glycine is just gly, and the single-letter amino acid code is G. Okay, now let's have a look at the structure of a lysine. So here's the core amino acid structure again, the amino group, the alpha carbon with a hydrogen off it, and the carboxylic acid group down here. Okay, now the R group of lysine is you have a methylene group four times. So let me show you this. So one, two, three, four. So you have this four carbon molecule here, and then right on the end of this fourth carbon, what you have is an amino group. Okay, so here you're going to have the amino group, the NH2 group. So we can see that lysine, okay, which uh, has the three-letter amino acid code LYS and the single-letter amino acid code K, has a very similar, has, sorry, has a very different structure from uh, the glycine amino acid. And basically, what you can do is you can take the skeletal muscle um, uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor where this residue is the glycine. So in skeletal muscle, it's this glycine. And you can replace it with the lysine that you have in the ganglionic nicotinic acetylcholine receptor and the CNS uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And if you do that, what happens is that suddenly the mutant receptor, which we call uh, the G153K mutant, so basically G for glycine, at the position 153, so if you took this protein and you counted down the amino acids of it, it would be the 153rd amino acid, and you mutate it to a K, a lysine, if you do that, then that mutant becomes sensitive to nicotine, just like the ganglionic and CNS ones. So that suggests that it is this glycine uh, that um, means that the skeletal muscle form is not sensitive to nicotine. And what it appears to do is uh, it realigns the aromatic rings that are within the aromatic nest and stops them interacting with the uh, nicotine like they do uh, in the um, CNS and ganglionic forms. Okay, so that's why the skeletal muscle uh, form of this nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is insensitive to nicotine, whereas uh, the ganglionic and CNS forms are sensitive to nicotine. 
Okay, so now what we'll move on to is why, uh, why nicotine is addictive. And for this, we need to look at the pathways involved in addiction in the brain, okay? And this pathway, uh, or this system, is what's known as the mesolimbic dopamine system. And often people will call this the reward system. So this appears, we think, this is the neurological correlate of a reward system, the mesolimbic dopamine system. So, basically, when you... Um, let's say when you eat a piece of cake, it makes you happy, it makes you satisfied. Basically, what it's activating is the mesolimbic dopamine system. Now, the mesolimbic dopamine system is not purely responsible for happiness, but it does seem to be uh, responsible for the reward process. And what do I mean by that? Basically, if you... Um, if you if you want to train an animal, if you say you, want, you have your dog and you want to train your dog to come to you when you call that dog's name, how do you do it? Well, basically, you call your dog's name. So my dog is called Toby. So I'll have my dog here. So this is my um, dog. Okay. Looks slightly more like a horse at the moment than a dog, but never mind. There's, there's my dog. Okay, with his tail. Right. Uh, so if I want my dog to come to me, I can call his name, and if he does come to me, then I will give him a treat, okay? And what that's going to do over time, if I continue doing this, and every time he comes to me, I give him a treat, then over time, it's going to, he's going to learn to come back when I call him. Now, this is what's known as positive reinforcement, okay? So basically, you reinforce a behavior by uh, a coupling the behavior, the desired behavior, to a reward, to a uh, desirable, um, desirable outcome, basically. So when Toby comes to me, when I call his name, he will get a treat, and he'll learn that if he comes, he gets a treat, and gradually he'll con the, pe the behavior will be reinforced, i.e., you will see the behavior, the amount of times that Toby actually performs the behavior, go up. So you'll see an increase in the behavior. Okay, that's positive reinforcement. And you can imply this, you can apply this to humans. Uh, it works perfectly well in humans. You can train people by um, giving them treats when they do things that you'd want them to do. Okay, so basically what we think is that nicotine and other substances of abuse, other addictive substances, hijack this positive reinforcement uh, system, which is the meso, we, well, we think it's the mesolimbic dopamine system in the brain. So, basically, when you smoke, when you, uh, when you inhale nicotine into your bloodstream, what that's going to do is it's going to activate the same neural mechanisms as Toby would get activated when I give him the treat, i.e. it will activate these neural mechanisms that lead to the behavior being reinforced. Okay, so when I give Toby the nice treat, let's say a piece of bacon, uh, certain neural mechanisms will be um, will be will be fired up basically and they will be uh, acting to ensure that the behavior of coming back the behavior that caused the reward is going to be positively reinforced so that Toby will do it more often basically okay so what is this mesolimbic dopamine system because once we've actually seen it then it'll make more sense okay so time for a bit of neuroanatomy then so, the, it's a very simple pathway. It's only got two things, really, in it. Now, we need to know where... I, oh, I want you to know where each of these structures are. Okay, so, if we draw a brain... Okay, let's start by drawing a brain. So, here is the temporal lobe, then the occipital lobe, then the parietal lobe back here, and then the frontal lobe, and then the prefrontal cortex at the front. Okay, so here's our cerebral hemisphere viewed from the side. We're looking at the brain from the left-hand side, and this is a human brain, not Toby's brain. Okay, so, um, what you then have underneath the cerebral hemispheres is poking out. If you're looking at, at it from the side, what you'll see 
is a structure known as the pons, so the pons is here, and then underneath the pons you'll have a structure known as the medulla, and then underneath the medulla you'll have the spinal cord going down further. And then also behind this structure known as the brain stem together, okay, and it's kind of like the support that the brain's sitting on, you have the cerebellum. Okay, so this is our uh, side view of the brain. So let's just colour in and label some of these structures. So this is the cerebellum, which means little brain. And that's very important in uh, the motor system, but we won't be talking about it today. So this is the cerebellum. We'll have the cerebellum outlined in an orange colour here. Okay. Then we have the medulla down here in blue. Okay, so this is the medulla. Its full name is the medulla oblongata, but um, I've never ever heard anyone refer to it as the medulla oblongata. It's something that you will see if you look on textbooks or on Wikipedia, uh, but everyone just refers to the medulla oblongata as the medulla. Okay, then below the medulla you have the spinal cord, okay, which goes down to the rest of the body. And then above the medulla, here, you have the pons. And now, what I'm going to do is continue this story upwards. Now, you can't see the structures that lie above the pons in this side view that I've shown you at the moment, because they are buried deep within the cerebral hemisphere. And basically, uh, the structures that are involved in the mesolimbic dopamine system, they are all deep within the cerebral hemisphere. So, and what we're going to do is cut away all this tat, and we're going to look at the structure, the continuation, basically, of the brainstem upwards. Okay, so we're going to look at what lies above the pons, basically, and the structures up there that are in the middle of the cerebral hemispheres, and we can't see when looking at the brain from the side angle. Okay, and we'll continue this story in the next video.